Chapter One of the Strange Case of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narration read by Elizabeth Clatt. Doctor Henry Jekyll read by Beth Thomas. Mister Edward Hyde read by Beth Thomas. Mister Utterson read by todd dr lanyon read by christine g paul read by rob board mr infield read by larry wilson mr guest read by jesse yin inspector newcomen read by alex lane the maid read by marianne housekeeper read by sarah swart newsboy read by lydia cook read by sarah swart chapter one the story of the door mr utterson the lawyer was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile cold scanty and embarrassed in discourse backward in sentiment lean long dusty dreary and yet somehow lovable at friendly meetings and when the wine was to his taste something eminently human beaconed from his eye something indeed which never found its way into his talk but which spoke not only in these silent symbols of the after-dinner face but more often and loudly in the acts of his life he was austere with himself drank gin when he was alone to mortify a taste for vintages and though he enjoyed the theatre had not crossed the doors of one for twenty years but he had an approved tolerance for others sometimes wondering almost with envy at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds and in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove i incline to cain's heresy he used to say quaintly i let my brother go to the devil in his own way in this character it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men and to such as these so long as they came about his chambers he never marked a shade of change in his demeanour no doubt the feat was easy to mr utterson for he was undemonstrative at the best and even his friendship seemed to be founded in a similar catholicity of good nature it is the mark of a modest man to accept his friendly circle ready-made from the hands of opportunity and that was the lawyer's way his friends were those of his own blood or those whom he had known the longest his affections like ivy were the growth of time they implied no aptness in the object hence no doubt the bond that united him to mr richard enfield his distant kinsman the well-known man about town it was a nut to crack for many what these two could see in each other or what subject they could find in common it was reported by those who encountered them in their sunday walks that they said nothing looked singularly dull and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend for all that the two men put the greatest store by these excursions counted them the chief jewel of each week and not only set aside occasions of pleasure but even resisted the calls of business that they might enjoy them uninterrupted it chanced on one of these rambles that their way led them down a by-street in a busy quarter of london the street was small and what is called quiet but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays the inhabitants were all doing well it seemed and all emulously hoping to do better still and laying out the surplus of their grains in coquetry so that the shop front stood along that thoroughfare with an air of invitation like rows of smiling saleswomen even on sunday when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighbourhood like a fire in a forest and with its freshly painted shutters well polished brasses and general cleanliness and gaiety of note instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger two doors from one corner on the left hand going east the line was broken by the entry of a court and just at that point a certain sinister block of building thrust forward its gable on the street it was two stories high showed no window 
nothing but a door on the lower story and a blind forehead of discoloured wall on the upper, and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. The door, which was equipped with neither bell nor knocker, was blistered and disdained. Tramps slouched into the recess and struck matches on the panels. Children kept shop upon the steps. The schoolboy had tried his knife on the mouldings, and, for close on a generation, no one had appeared to drive away these random visitors, or to repair their ravages. Mr. Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by-street, but when they came abreast of the entry, the former lifted up his cane and pointed. "'Did you ever remark that door?' he asked, and when his companion had replied in the affirmative, "'It is connected in my mind,' added he, "'with a very odd story.' "'Indeed,' said Mr. Utterson, with a slight change of voice. "'And what was that?' "'Well, it was this way.' returned mr enfield i was coming home from some place at the end of the world about three o'clock of a black winter morning and my way lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but the lamps street after street and all the folks asleep street after street all lighted up as if for a procession and all as empty as a church till at last i got into that state of mind when a man listens and listens and begins to long for a sight of a policeman all at once i saw two figures one a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk and the other a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street well sir the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner and then came the horrible part of the thing for the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man. It was like some damned juggernaut. I gave a few hallo, took to my heels, collared my gentleman, and brought him back to where there was already quite a group about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance but gave me one look so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me like running the people who had turned out were the girl's own family and pretty soon the doctor for whom she had been sent put in his appearance well the child was not much the worse more frightened according to the sawbones and there you might have supposed would be an end to it but there was one curious circumstance i had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight so had the child's family which was only natural but the doctor's case was what struck me he was the usual cut and dry apothecary of no particular age and colour with a strong edinburgh accent and about as emotional as a bagpipe well sir he was like the rest of us every time he looked at my prisoner i saw that sawbones turned sick and white with desire to kill him i knew what was in his mind just as he knew what was in mine and killing was out of the question we did the next best we told the man we could and would make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end of london to the other if he had any friends or any credit we undertook that he should lose them and all the time as we were pitching it in red hot we were keeping the women off him as best we could, for they were as wild as harpies. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. And there was the man in the middle, with a kind of black, sneering coolness. Frightened, too, I could see that. But carrying it off, sir, really like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless no gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene says he name your figure well we screwed him up to a hundred pounds for the child's family he would have clearly liked to stick it out but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief and at last he struck the next thing was to get the money and where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door 
whipped out a key went in and presently came back with the matter of ten pounds in gold and a check for the balance on counts drawn payable to bearer and signed with a name that i can't mention though it's one of the points of my story but it was a name at least very well known and often printed the figure was stiff but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine i took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal and that a man does not in real life walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's check for close upon a hundred pounds but he was quite easy and sneering set your mind at rest says he i will stay with you till the banks open and cash the check myself so we all set off the doctor and the child's father and our friend and myself and passed the rest of the night in my chambers and next day when we had breakfasted went in a body to the bank i gave in the check myself and said i had every reason to believe that it was a forgery not a bit of it the check was genuine tut tut said mr utterson i see you feel as i do said mr enfield yes it's a bad story for my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with a really damnable man and the person that drew the check is the very pink of the propriety celebrated too and what makes it worse one of your fellows who do what they call good blackmail i suppose an honest man paying through the nose for some of the capers of his youth blackmail house is what i call the place with the door in consequence though even that you know is far from explaining all he added and with the words fell into a vein of musing from this he was recalled by mr utterson asking rather suddenly and you don't know if the drawer of the check lives there a likely place isn't it returned mr enfield but i happen to have noticed his address he lives in some square or other and you never asked about the place with the door said mr utterson no sir i had a delicacy was the reply i feel very strongly about putting questions it partakes too much of the style of the day of judgment you start a question and it's like starting a stone you sit quietly on the top of a hill and away the stone goes starting others and presently some bland old bird the last you would have thought of is knocked on the head in his own back garden and the family have to change their name no sir i make it a rule of mine the more it looks like queer street the less i ask a very good rule too said the lawyer but i have studied the place for myself continued mr enfield it seems scarcely a house there is no other door and nobody goes in or out of it but once in a great while the gentleman of my adventure there are three windows looking on the court on the first floor none below the windows are always shut but they are clean and then there is a chimney which is generally smoking so somebody must live there and yet it's not so sure for the buildings are so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins the pair walked on again for a while in silence and then enfield said mr utterson that's a good rule of yours yes uh, i think it is returned enfield but for all that continued the lawyer there's one point i want to ask i want to ask the name of that man who walked over the child well said mr enfield i can't see what harm it would do it was a man of the name of hyde hm said mr utterson what sort of a man is he to see he is not easy to describe there is something wrong with his appearance something displeasing something downright detestable i never saw a man i so disliked and yet i scarce know why he must be deformed somewhere he gives a strong feeling of deformity although i couldn't specify the point he's an extraordinary lucky man and yet i really can name nothing out of the way no sir i can make no hand of it i can't describe him 
and it's not want of memory for i declare i can see him in this moment mr utterson again walked some way in silence and obviously under a weight of consideration you are sure he used a key he inquired at last my dear sir began enfield surprised out of himself yes i know said utterson i know it must seem strange the fact is if i do not ask you the name of the other party it is because i know it already you see richard your tale has gone home if you have been inexact in any point you had better correct it i think you might have warned me returned the other with a touch of sullenness but i have been pedantically exact as you call it the fellow had a key and what's more he has it still i saw him use it not a week ago mr utterson sighed deeply but said never a word and the young man presently resumed here is another lesson to say nothing said he i am ashamed of my long tongue let us make a bargain never to refer to this again with all my heart said the lawyer i shake hands on that richard End of chapter 1